Hello everyone, my name is Geoffrey Huguet and I work at AdaCore. AdaCore is a company providing open source tools for the Ada language. In my team, we develop a tool for formal verification of a subset of Ada named Spark. Today, I will present why and how we added contracts to the GCC GNAT Ada standard libraries. The presentation is organized in four parts. First, I will give a quick overview of the Ada and Spark languages. Then I will explain which problems we can encounter when using external libraries in Spark. Next, I will talk about how we added contracts to the Ada standard libraries and which level of detail we can achieve with those. And finally, I will talk about related works on other languages or other libraries. First, I will talk about the Ada and Spark languages. Ada is a general purpose language. It's quite old. It was first released in 1983. It has a Pascal-like syntax where declarations and its instructions are separated. It's a strongly typed language and user can provide additional constraints. For example, here, small int is a type of integer range from minus 100 to 100. We can define a subtype of small int, small nat, with an additional constraint of being ranged from 0 to 100. Ada also natively supports arrays. For example, small int a is a type of array indexed by integers from 1 to 10 and containing value of types small int. These types and constraints are associated with checks mandated by the language. If I assign a value x to y, which is of type small nat, there will be a range check to ensure that x is in the correct range, here between 0 and 100. If I access a value in an array, an index check will be performed to ensure that the called index is in the bounds of the array. These checks are performed either at compile time, if the values are statically known, otherwise the compiler will insert code to perform those checks at runtime. Contract-based programming is another feature of Ada. We can add contracts, for example, pre- and post-condition for subprograms. Subprograms are either function, which returns value, or procedures, which work on side effects. In the example, increment is a procedure taking x as a parameter. The mode of x is in-out, which means that increment will be able to read and write to x in its body. We can also add pre- and post-condition on increment, which are made of Boolean expressions. The precondition states that it's not possible to call increment on the last integer, and indeed, we cannot increment the last integer. The postcondition states that the value of x at the end of the ex execution of increment will be strictly larger than the value before the call. It's also possible to define strong and weak type invariants. Strong invariants need to hold all the time, while weak invariants need to hold only at the boundary of the enclosing package of the type. This example shows a definition of a type of array sorted in the ascending order. The invariant here is strong, so it should hold all the time. It states that for every index in the array before the last one, the value stored at the index should be smaller than the value stored at the next index. All these contracts can also be executed at runtime if we specify it at compilation. The compiler will insert code to check them dynamically. The goal of Spark is to verify statically, so without running the code, that the checks that are usually performed at runtime will pass. It will prove the checks mandated by the Ada language, such as a range check or index checks, but will also verify the contracts in variants pre post conditions. If I declare a value of type sorted R, Spark will check that the predicate on sorted R holds for the given value. When calling a subprogram with a precondition, such as increment, Spark will prove that the precondition holds with the given parameter. Spark is a static analyzer, which means that it will not run the program to analyze it. Spark proceeds with deductive verification. It takes the code annotated with contracts, which will be translated to mathematical formulas. Those formulas will be given to automatic provers which will prove that the properties are valid or not. Spark analysis is sound, which means that it will not miss any error. However, it is not complete. 
This means that when Spark cannot prove a check, it doesn't mean that the check will fail at runtime. Spark might just be missing information to prove it. Now, I will give more context about the problems that can happen when using unannotated libraries in Spark code. Spark analysis is modular. This means that each subprogram will be analyzed separately. To do so, when another subprogram is called, Spark will try to prove its precondition and then assume its postcondition. If the subprogram is not annotated, Spark makes several assumptions. First, it will assume that no exception will be raised and that the subprogram has no effect on global variables. It's the case here. In this example, I used subprogram from the standard library ADA strings and bounded, which provides strings with variable lengths, and ADA text IO, the input output library. When I analyze the subprogram, Spark says that there are no global contracts available. It assumes that the subprograms used have no effect on global items. We can ask ourselves if Spark is making correct assumptions here. For the use of unbounded string, the answer is probably yes. The subprograms have actually no effect on global items. But for IO, this is less sure because IO procedures have an effect on the file system, for example. Thus, we need to annotate the subprograms with correct global contracts, at least, so that Spark makes correct assumptions. First, I will talk about modeling of global effects of subprograms. As said earlier, subprograms from ADA strings unbounded have no effect on global items. We can add these contracts to the subprograms with the aspect global null. When we do this, the warning emitted by Spark disappears. However, this is not the case for text IO. Procedures here have an effect on the file system or even on the standard output and input. There is no global variable representing the file system, so how can we model these effects? One solution in Spark is to create what we call an abstract state. In fact, it's a virtual object and we decide that it represents the file system. Here, it does not need to be linked to any variable in the program. We declare in the example that the package text.io has an abstract state called file system and after, we can use it as any other global variables in constructs. Here, procedure get has an effect in out on the file system. This way, it's possible to model correctly, even if it is not precise, the global effects of the called subprograms. Spark now will make correct assumptions about the global effects of subprograms from Tech.io. It's also possible to add contracts to protect from runtime errors. In the ADA reference manual, which defines the GCSignat ADA standard library specifications, we can see that the behavior of subprograms is fully detailed. For example, the insert function may propagate index error if the parameters are inconsistent. Here, before it needs to be in the correct range. And indeed, if we test it on this code, the parameters do not satisfy what's specified in the reference manual and, at execution, an index error is raised. But if we analyze the code with Spark, it doesn't say anything. In fact, this is because Spark doesn't enter the body of insert and thus doesn't know that it might propagate the error. We need to add a precondition to prevent calls to insert with inconsistent parameters. So first we ensure that before is in the expected range. The second part of the precondition is about the length. We need to make sure that the length of the resulting string is not larger than the last integer. Otherwise, at, at runtime, there will be an overflow. If we rerun the proof, now Spark complains that the insert function has not been called with consistent parameters, which is what we want. Let's move on to a second example on the text IO library. It defines procedures opening and deleting a file, respectively open and delete. Those procedures can propagate status error depending on the fact that the file is open or not. Fortunately, a function is open is defined later and allows us to test exactly this. It's possible to use it in the contract. So we add preconditions in the procedures open and delete. We want to open files that are not already open and we want to delete files that are open. And we can test it on actual code. The first call to delete at line four will propagate an error because it's called on a file that's not already open. Spark detects it and says that the precondition might fail. 
However, lines 5 and 6 are correct. The subprograms are called in the correct order. But Spark does not manage to prove that we use the procedures correctly. We also get messages stating that files are not initialized. In fact, Spark is missing two informations here. First, we need to annotate the type so that Spark knows that by default, a file is not open. Second, we need to add post condition to open and delete so that Spark knows the open status of the file after a call to these subprograms. So first, I add a default initial condition to the type file, file type. This way, Spark will know that if we don't provide a value to a variable of type file type at its declaration, is open will return false on this variable. We also add post conditions to open and delete to specify their action on the file. After the call to open, the file is open. After the call to delete, the file is closed. And if we rerun the proof, we have everything that we wanted. Spark emits a check when we try to call delete on file one, which is not open, but it's also able to prove that we use the procedures correctly in the next, in the next lines. This is not the only error that can be propagated by subprograms from Ada Text IO. There are plenty of others. A mode error is related to the mode in which files are open. In file will be a red mode, out file will be a write mode. Mode error can be propagated when we try to read characters from a file open in the write mode, for example, and we handle this error in precondition as well as status error. There are other errors, just such as name error raised when the file does not exist on the file system, or end error raised when a file terminator is read in the procedure. Use error is related to the external environment. We could not add precondition prote protecting from these errors since it was not possible to express them with Spark contracts. In certain cases, we can add complete contracts to fully detail the actions of subprograms. Let's take the example with the call to insert. I added an assertion after the call to check that str2 is equal to ABCD. An assertion is just a Boolean expression that we want Spark to prove in the subprogram body. But Spark says that it cannot prove the assertion. It's missing some information. Let's have a look at the contract of insert. Indeed, we don't have any past condition on insert. Spark doesn't have any information on the return string after the call. So I'm taking the other part of the rule in the reference manual, which states that the content of the return string is the concatenation of the first B4 elements of source, then the elements from new item, and then the rest of the elements of source if they exist. It's also specified that the lower bound of the return string is one. So let's add this as post condition. First, we write that the lower bound of the return string is one, and also that its length is the length of the source plus the length of new item. The first before element of the result are the first before element of source. The next element are all those in new item. And finally, if there are remaining characters in source, they are appended to the result. And now the assertion is proved. Spark has everything it needs to prove the content of str2 after the call. Insert is one subprogram from a long list of subprograms working on fixed length strings. They are part of the lab library Ada Strings Fixed. There are such subprograms, strings translations, transformations, selectors, and constructors. Today, most of them are specified with complete contracts, just as insert, which allows any user to try and be able to prove precise properties when working with strings. Finally, I want to talk about similar works that have been done for other libraries. For example, C also has a verification tool called Pharmacy, and it's packaged with annotated header files for the C standard libraries. It provides contracts, sometimes incomplete, but also complete ones for certain libraries. Grammar Tech has been doing some work to annotate more libraries from the C standard libraries. For Java, it's the case as well. Some of the standard libraries are annotated for OpenGML, it's one verification tool on Java code. Besides this, community can be involved in this effort as well. There's an initiative called Annotations for All. The goal is to enable anyone in the community to participate in this effort. You can check it out at the link annotationsforall.org. 
but standard libraries are not the only libraries that can be used in Spark code. Third-party libraries might be used as well, and users will, fa will face the same problems as with standard libraries if they are not annotated. One of the projects in AdaCore was to provide a spike, Spark binding of two cryptography libraries, Twistsalt and Lipsodium. The Spark binding consists in binding the C functions from the original libraries, but taking advantage of contract-based programming in Ada to ensure the correct usage of the libraries, and also to prove user code. Another project was the Spark binding of Cyclone TCP, an implementation of a TCP IP stack in C. A similar work has been done for this library, but some parts were entirely rewritten in Spark in order to verify them, adding even more reliability to it. There are some next steps that are already planned for us. Uh, first, we want to specify more libraries from the GCC CNAT ADA standard libraries, as it allows to make the software more reliable. Secondly, the work we did on the standard libraries can also lead to a verification of the given implementation of the library. In conclusion, I want to emphasize three main points. First, there are different levels of detail when adding contracts. The three ones that I presented today were the modeling of global effects, the protection from runtime errors, and then the complete contracts. All of them help to increase the safety of software. They can serve a proof purpose because we're able to verify more properties, but they can also be seen as documentation. Indeed, we are able to know even partially which are the effects of the subprograms just by looking at the contracts. Finally, this is a substantial effort. Contracts can be very long or difficult to express, for example, in text IO. The community can also participate in this effort through initiatives like Annotations for All. If you are interested in the subject, you can check out a blog post on AdaCore's blog. It talks about the binding and annotation of two cryptography libraries, TweetSalt and Lipsodium. If you are interested in trying Ada or Spark, you can check out the online Ada and Spark courses on learn.adacore.com or download the Spark toolset on the AdaCore's website. Since Spark is an open source tool, you can access its source code on the GitHub repository, Spark 2014. Thank you for your attention.